Are we just meeting here with a couple of friends? There's Luke, who's 21, and there's another friend uh, who's a bit older than that, and two very, very supportive men who um, come to the Vihara and express their support and joy in being around the Bikini Sangha. And it's, it's just very heartening, you know, to see how much it matters to people like this. And uh, I don't know, I asked you, I think, a while back, Luke, why? you felt it was important to have bikinis because you're obviously so inspired by, by coming here and yeah. offering incredible dana to the Sangha. <laughs> well, it was just that, kind of like I said, the fact it made me sad to think that like, you know, so many passionate women, and especially when I'm at my Vihara, you know, some of those dedicated followers of Buddhism are women. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's, it would just make me so sad to not be able to stand side by side with them, you know, in a, in a way that's equitable and fair and really empowering as the Buddha kind of intended for the for the Bakuni Sangha, you know, and, uh, and it honors the history that we hold to so dearly uh, of, of Venerable Sangha Mitra Mahatheri, you know, um, it, it, it just has always shown throughout Buddhist history that women alongside men have had the desire to ordain and to be liberated and Sangha Mitra is the example of that. Mahinda came first, ordained men, but women wanted to come too. So we created that and I think that's what the Dhamma is, is a path of liberation for all beings, not all beings but women, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I just, I would just like all people to have that chance. Yeah, all people. Yeah. Because mm. obviously women are 51% or so of the population, <laughs> it's um, a big exclusion 51% of the seen population. Right, right, <laughs> the seen population. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. And what do you think women, do you think there's something women have to offer in particular? Or I, think it's, I think it's that uniqueness of being a woman that allows them to help other women liberate themselves from the things. Because I think men can walk away from society, but they're, they're, they're still already the dominant force in society. They're never, never necessarily oppressed by their roles. I think as a bhikkhuni you have to unlearn not only the ways of regular life, but the, the sort of things that are put on you as a woman in society. And so I think to have women that are stepping outside of all this stuff that society puts on women, the sort of structure that society puts mm -hmm. on women, mm -hmm. I think that's the value that they have, is, is, is real social change for women in the here and now, and also liberation in the, in the Dhamma, in the Buddha Dhamma, in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, wonderful. Can I ask why Bikunis and why not eight preceptors, ten preceptors? Because I think the Vinaya is a deep part of the practice, and I think I think the tradition is a deep part of the practice. I think regardless of whether you take whatever precepts, if your practice is there, you will attain nirvana and all due hope and all due uh, goodness that arises from your practice. But I think I think there's no reason to exclude bhikkhunis from all that which Buddha instituted. I mean, the love for the Buddha, the, the care and the, the, the reverence one has for the Buddha is beyond sacred and beyond beautiful. And to exclude them from being able to do that in their full, recite Pakti Mokka and all these very important parts of our tradition that were handed from us by the, by the Bhagavata, you know, I, I don't think they should be excluded from it because he didn't exclude them. Mm. So. Yeah, and, and I know that you have aspirations possibly to ordain. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned something earlier that the body can be ready but the mind has to be yeah. ready, which is very yeah. wise. So you're looking carefully obviously for such opportunities and you know preparing yourself very carefully and um, I'm wondering if your support for you know women and um, bhikkhunis would impact your choices around that in some way. I think it definitely has. I think that's why I love Sri Lanka. I think that's why I love the tradition. You know it's outside of the big dispute between between ordination and stuff like that and it's also slowly been progressing since the late 90s towards ordination for women you know mm -hmm. salmoneras are growing and things like that and, and I think I think there's a real future for women's ordination coming back in full in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. I think and I think that's going to be the most amazing thing to see in, in all honesty yeah. the most amazing yeah. Yeah, so you'd consider the Sri Lankan tradition? Yeah, because they're, they're bringing it back. Since 1996, they've been moves here and there, and I've been, yeah. I've been enjoying seeing all the stuff. Great, great, great. The first, yeah. the first ever yeah. female monk I met, or bhikkhuni, or, well, she was a Samanera, but you know, she was, she was from Sri Lanka. Mm. And she was like, the first time I met a woman in an orange robe. Mm. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> yeah. You know, one thing that I've noticed sometimes amongst monks who are supportive, they often cite the reason for their support being around gender equity and having to present Buddhism in a way that's inspiring or that's um, going to appeal to people. But they very rarely talk about compassion for how it might feel as a woman not to have the opportunity. Mm. They very rarely talk about a reason that could be seeing it from a woman's perspective. Um, I don't know, have you thought about that? Like, have you thought about... Um, yeah, I think mm. absolutely. I think, you know, when I've talked to uh, women practitioners and I say to them, oh, you could ordain, but you have, you know, maybe one or two choices, you know, you're not, you're not given that I could go to seven different countries and I could be ordained tomorrow, but they either can go to a Mahayana lineage or they can go, you know, to be a Tilashin or a Mai Chi or something like that, but they're not, you know, women in the Eastern world, in the heartlands of Buddhism, which is where you really want to go when you're early on, you know, you can't stay attached to the West if you want to really get into a Dhamma practice. So, you know, it's not necessarily a place where women are given the same respect as practitioners, even in some minor forms of ordination. Yeah. You know, I know Mai Chi's aren't looked upon quite as seriously as mm -hmm. they should be. Right. Are not respected as practitioners as they should be, despite that some of them have been some of the most amazing practitioners, I think, yeah. in the past couple yeah. hundred years. Man Chi Kyu, for example, yeah. Kwe. So, I think, yeah, I think the limiting for women is, is, is sad, because I think, <laughs> because once in the Teddy Gathas, Buddha, Buddha tells us not one, ten, not hundreds, but thousands of women who have attained enlightenment. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no bars on it. Right, you know? it's possible. Entirely. If you've given a chance and you've given the conditions, right? Because for me as a woman, it's less about respect, it's more about opportunities, conditions. You know, being able to actually live as an arms mendicant and have that support that exactly. enables me to go forth in the first place and to sustain that going forth without relying on friends and family, as many women in Asia have to. Mm. You know? Of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about other people your age, sort of other men who you know are like I think, practicing Buddhists, do they? I think a lot of people are nervous, yeah. I think a lot of people get nervous mm -hmm. about it, they don't want to be you know doing a, the five and the five anatarika kamas and being involved in something they think is potentially controversial but I think mm -hmm. people are very nervous when they're lay people, I think especially when you're young and you come into Buddhism and you haven't really looked at it, you're going to want to take authority's words for it, you know mm -hmm. different people say different things but I think a lot of young people and a lot of people in general, at least in my in my uh, community at the LBV, they are very supportive of, yeah. of pecuniary ordination mm -hmm. and they see no problem with it at all. Yeah. They see no problem with it at all. Yeah. In fact, yeah. most people, t most people, when I said to them, "Oh, there's only you know, there's no nuns in the world," they're like, "No, no, there are bikunis, there are bikunis, You know, don't listen to so and so. They're, they've got them all around. They're just not as common." Hidden. I didn't know there were any until I saw them. At yeah. 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 And I've been to what well, three count this as a temple, three places with you. Yeah. And I found Bikuni's got so much I can learn from and they give so much, as much as any of the male monks I've met who, who I quite like as well. Yeah. And I think, why is this even an issue? I said to Luke, I don't understand right. it. <laughs> no, I don't. I've <laughs> been back. Um, but I'm wondering, because you mentioned, you know, some younger people new to Buddhism at first feel a little bit hesitant because they're not quite sure. So did you feel that too? And how yeah. did you change over well, time? My first, my first initial thing was to want to just stay away from it. You know, uh -huh. the idea of thinking, oh, the Sangha parted ways is a, it's not a light thing. You know, it's a very, very scary thing as a lay practitioner to, to think about that sort of thing and to not really know who did what. And, you know, then you, know, you can only learn so much about a situation after the fact when you were like seven when it happened and so on and so forth. Are you talking about the yeah. bikini ordinations in Perth and yeah, the yeah, effect yeah. that had on the type? Yes certain branch of the yes. Thai forest tradition. That yeah. is, that is what I'm referring to. So that was a, that was a nervous thing for me. And I remember yeah. thinking like, I remember seeing someone like, I'm not sure how to feel about it in regards. Like, how do I, how do I think about it? And they said, let your heart tell you what it thinks. Mm. That's what they said to me. And when I stopped thinking so, getting in my own head and trying to be all strict and be like, no, 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 we must do Buddhism this way, or Dhamma is this way. And I let that kind of slowly drift away. My heart told me that it was just the right thing in, in a very important manner and you know I just came to learn more and more about the women's order you know, and it just inspired me continuously even with the Silodaras you know I often spend a lot of time with a lovely um, senior nun whose name I won't say mm -hmm. but um, and I often find even in a short conversation 
there's there's so much meta in it. And mm. I find the same thing here as well. I find I found like when I saw Venerable Lupeka when she had come to the to the Vihara, I was blown away. I was almost like a little fan. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I was so I was so excited by that time. So my views had massively changed by by the time. Mm. But I think it's just a lack of knowledge and the fact that anything involved with slang sangha disputes is is something seen as quite heavy and yeah, anatarika yeah. come at you know. Yeah. It's not it's not something people wanna <laughs> dive in on but I think it's important for the future yeah. and the, for, of the Dhamma. For the Dhamma, for the spread and longevity of the Dhamma. But I yeah. think there's now a mo momentum gathering yeah. to switch the, the viewpoint. Yeah. 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 And I just I look forward to the day that we perform homage to the to the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha and the bhikkhunis get to be part of those who are paid homage to you know yeah. in, a, in a full way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because there's no there's no genders in our chants that praise the Sangha. You know, there's none of these things that imp imply it's a man yeah. thing. Yeah. You Buddha know. Dhamma and the Bhikkhu Sangha. <laughs> yeah, Buddha Dhamma and Bhikkhu Sangha, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you ask some people, you know, they might say it. But yeah, I just think the Sangha is, is the fourfold Sangha for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, great. Wow. Wonderful. Well, I might come back to you, but I'm interested in hearing from our other uh, guests as well. Um, we won't mention your name, um, but yeah, I mean, you're welcome to say as much as you want about yourself or about your views yeah. on bhikkhuni ordination. Yeah, I'd, I would like to start just to comment on uh, what you said about the split in the Sangha because I thought a lot about that myself and uh, I have reached to the conclusion for my so that the split was really when the Bikuni Sangha died out uh, like a thousand years ago mm. and that was probably done by kind of like force or they were not supported and uh, in forbidden in countries like Sri Lanka and I think that is the real split and now we are mending it and making it whole again. That's, oh, that's a lovely perspective. Mm. Yeah, because I think when we talk about a Sangha split we've got to realise that the Sangha is something much, much bigger than any particular tradition mm -hmm. and that actually the way the Buddha defined the Sangha was um, in terms of a Sangha who are local to a particular monastery, mm. it wasn't actually based on a kind of system which is a little bit like a kind of Vatican <laughs> system with sort of the big bosses at the top and then all the branch monasteries that need to follow suit. In fact, the Buddha um, made each Sangha independent for a reason, so that depending on the circumstance, the conditions, the, the uh, harmony within the community, and what was suitable for the community, decisions could be made. Um, so, yeah, I think it's important to um, not necessarily... Uh, yeah, to change the narrative on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and to realise also that the split, if you want to perceive it as that, was not inevitable. I mean, that was a decision people made to no, that's, that's um, the remove conclusion. themselves um, I think, from yeah. that. I think, I think them being resistant to it, when if it were up to me, if I was in that decision, I would have took it. I would have took the opportunity to say, okay, these are bikinis now. Let's give it to the rest of them. You know, let's go around. Let's ordain all of them. Yeah. Just, just have it done, and then, then it's there. You know, it's there. The bikini order exists. Mm -hmm. We all can just be, be happy and keep it going. But I think their own traditionalism, if I want to put it that way, the conservatism is is an aversion to the future and also an attachment to the past. And mm -hmm. I think I think it's very difficult to imagine that Buddha would want us to think in such a manner and Buddha wouldn't want us to recognise the conditions of the world we live in today because right. it's the Anicca. We don't live in the world yeah. of the Buddha. Yes, it's interesting because we can say it's Anicca but then also it can be used in ways that's not so initial, you know, people can sort of go to the text and say, well, this is what it says and that's that. So the law of initia is used sometimes to, you know, we use these things to basically reinforce our own viewpoints, don't we? Mm. <coughs> sometimes. Because it does seem that the Buddha actually left uh, the opportunity for the bhikkhuni sangha to be reinstated, should it ever need to be, by saying that bhikkhus can ordain bhikkhunis, and that wasn't rescinded. It was just added to when a bhikkhuni sangha came into existence. It was added to, and then the Buddha said, "Well, the bhikkhuni sangha should ordain bhikkhunis naturally because he wanted to empower bhikkhunis to choose their own sangha members, isn't it?" Mm -hmm. um, but but the other one still stands. So, yeah. 
I think we can argue either way, depending on our view. <laughs> um, but what 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 do you think? I mean, why is um, is Bikuni ordination important to you personally? Oh yeah, very much so. I'm from Norway, and you know, all of Scandinavia is probably some of the most progressive countries in the world when it comes to gender equality. So. Um, trying to build an organization there with uh, some friends and monastics that uh, uh, is not going to be well supported if we, uh, you know, have a Norwegian view on equality in that organization. And we have other groups in Norway that uh, I have been connected to, and they have. Uh, I know some of the members there and they think it's a very it's like a sore thumb or a difficult issue that the, the, both the lay women and uh, monastics mm. are treated equally uh, when it comes to a chance to ordain but also other other things uh, like typical Thai traditional things with the, the order who goes to the food first and you know mm. maybe details but uh, it's sort of a system that many women they come to those temples a couple of times and I think I don't want to go there this is like silly for us Norwegians so right. and it's yeah. discrimination that actually impacts you psychologically that's been my experience like if you're a junior nun and you go and you're at the back of the line that's one thing even if you're a middle nun and you go, but if you actually start leading something, like in my position, and I'm still walking behind the junior monks, it actually starts to feel dishonest, and it does a disservice to those who support bikunis, because it's as though we're just not as valuable um, as the monks, and that gives the wrong message to the female supporters too, and to other women, it's, it's perpetuating uh, misogyny and, and, and discrimination. And, um, but that's the rule of the Buddha. What's the role of the Buddha? I thought, I thought the Buddha <coughs> is the one that said that, that a bikini must always bow even to a, like a, to a junior. That's monk. a little bit different from going behind behind a junior monk in the arms round. There's nothing actually There's mentioned nothing about the, that, the as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't think it would be a big deal, but I, I mm. would have thought the bikinis would have went on arms round independently mm. of, of the bikinis. Mm. Would have. Yeah, quite often, and that's how some monasteries do it. Actually, they have the table, and they have one row of bikinis <laughs> on one side, and a row of bikinis on the other side. But I think there's something incredibly healing, and um, that feels right when basically gender is set aside, and it's all about your ordination. You know, it's all about seniority in the robes. Yeah. And the thing is, this this is accepted very easily, actually, in communities communities that um, where there are strong leaders and where it's explained properly mm. um, and where it starts to happen, people feel good about it. Yeah. I think the thing is, is that when it comes to the Buddhist world, and I'm, I'm really talking about Asia here, is that I think women in those societies aren't socially conditioned to see religion as something they have a, a deep opportunity in. I think they're conditioned to say, you give food to the monks, maybe you go do some puja, and then, you know, mm. that's, that's your commitment done. That's kind of what they're taught. And like, you know, I've had experiences where I've seen like women who must have been Buddhist their whole lives, you know, 40, 50 years, and they're asking, what is karma? What is this? What is that? You know, they're never socialized or taught in a way that clearly these, the, their husbands and their sons are all very, very aware of these mm. things, you know. It seems like girls don't get quite given the same education in the Buddhist world in terms of the Dhamma. They get taught, oh, do some chanting, know, know your gathas and and be a social worker. Yeah, essentially. <coughs> essentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's an access issue too, like access to teachers, because if there aren't monasteries for nuns, who's going to be teaching them? Mm -hmm. um, you know, even where there are uh, monasteries for monks and nuns, for example in Perth, uh, where there are two very separate um, forest monasteries, the nuns don't get nearly as much teaching input as the monks. Of um, it's just not available to us because the bhikkhuni sangha is newer um, mm. and most monks monasteries remain single gender so it is an issue in, in starting up a really strong uh, bhikkhuni sangha and it means we have to basically learn the dhamma a lot on our own mm. um, and yet be at least the same mm. standard in terms of teaching and running um, communities right because we have to actually show we have something to offer mm. so yeah, yeah I think, I think the fledgling 
the fledgling Silo Daughters had a, uh, I think, a similar struggle in their, in their place in Hertfordshire. I think, from what I understand, that was purely supposed to be work for women, but it just didn't play out that way. And that's probably because they just didn't have the same support in terms of in terms of that stuff there I don't know exactly yeah. but one would assume so yeah and, and this uh, is the danger this is how discrimination is perpetuated because we don't have the same support and therefore don't always um, thrive as well um, in those systems people then think oh well women just aren't as competent but I think the dumb <laughs> teaches us you know yeah the dumb <laughs> teaches us that everything you know this this thing this five kind of thing that I call my body and mind is entirely uh, dependently arisen, it's conditioned, it's a result of the conditions I'm in right now because I'll be very different here than I will in say a forest monastery or mm. in a meditation center, you know, there'll be different um, things that come up but uh, yeah, yeah, but I would like to know a little bit more about uh, um, yeah, how it might influence say men's own feelings about the path, about Buddhism or about uh, uh, you know, since the, the theme is uh, why mm. I support Bikuni so strongly, I'd like to share a quite personal story and a little lengthy, so bear with me. Yeah. Uh, but like I told, I was uh, involved in some temples in Norway that uh, didn't have a good gender equality, put it that way. Mm. And after a while, because I had such reverence for the for the Buddha, and you know that's what I was taught, I was conditioned into almost starting to believe in those things myself. And for me, like the word of the Buddha was really something I took very seriously. Uh, so, and I traveled to Wat Pananachat, Wat Papong, and I experienced it there, and I saw that there is something here. I saw the women, lay women visiting there, they weren't treated uh, very nicely, some of them, and, and it, it felt wrong, but still I was sort of buying into that thing, that you need to be humble, and it's good to be humble, <laughs> and not demanding, and a very part of Thai culture, and maybe also of Buddhism, but it can be misused in a way. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, then something happened to me. I was sitting at home and at that period I was very, very dedicated to reading books and watching YouTube videos on Buddhism. That's all I did after I was done with work from from I went to bed for maybe a year. So I was like totally focused on that. And then I saw a Dhamma talk by a nun from the US called Ayatasa Aloka. And it was from a talk she gave in uh, Colombo. And that talk just moved me so much that I started to have a very, very strong sense of pity and uh, it was an experience that I never had in uh, my sober life, to put it that way. It was uh, the hairs were standing up on my head and I was crying and laughing intermittently. It was just spontaneous. And, uh, I was like surprised, what is this? What's <laughs> happening to me? And it was really, really strong. And it was, uh, I asked my teacher about it later. He said it was like strong faith in Buddhism and that you heard the Dhamma in a way that really hit you. And then you get the uh, wisdom from that or you sort of uh, progress in your understanding. And that can give a very strong emotional experience. And after that, I was like all in supporting bikinis. I uh -huh. donated lots to uh, those to some group called Alliance for Bikinis in the U.S. I traveled to meet Damananda in uh, in Thailand, and uh, yeah, it's been my sort of main thing ever since that. Uh, oh. Yeah. And I think you've been to the monasteries in Perth, and now you're here as well. So, yeah. I mean, what is it that you get from coming to Bikuni monasteries? Is uh, you obviously like to be in Bikuni monasteries? Is there something special, or, or is it a show of support? Or well, it, it certainly is different from uh, the way monks teach. Uh, I have some of that I hold very in high regard, but there is another. Uh, yeah, I want to say, like Luke said, more meta and uh, 
and I'm sort of a soft guy, so I <laughs> I prefer that kind of uh, uh, surroundings where you can just relax and be yourself. And I feel that uh, I can do more so in a, not all uh, male monasteries, maybe, but uh, yeah, there is certainly a different and difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that um, <clears throat> the faith for you and the, the um, rationale, if you like, or the beginning of your support for bhikkhunis came about through directly experiencing the benefit of having bhikkhunis, like the, the benefit in terms of teaching the Dhamma, and whether that was because Ayatataloka is a bhikkhuni or because we just need more people to, to teach the Dhamma. Do you think that teaching is uh, an important part of creating a strong bikini Sangha, you know, actually um, showing what bikinis have to offer. Definitely. And, and I, the only sort of concern is that there are too few of them, so they get burnt out and they work themselves half to death, many of them. They are swamped with, uh, and they have so many followers and they are very popular. So I have very, very big respect for the bikinis that are going forth mm -hmm. now and working with this I know mm -hmm. how much they have to do and yeah. I'm at the moment trying to help a little with building a website called kema.org mm -hmm. which is sort of going to be a social network app for followers of uh, well for meditators and Dhamma friends uh, really but mm -hmm. it's made uh, especially with bikinis in mind. Is that based on Aya, Aya Kema? Yeah, it's uh, sort of the name, uh, the, the, the domain name was available, and it's uh, <laughs> a, 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 a homage well, to I, uh, uh, I uh, came as a um, yeah. very high regarded practitioner across mm. the board. I mean, yeah. you cannot find man or woman, a person, I wouldn't say they read her book, uh, Going Nowhere, Being No, but something like that. I can't remember the exact name verbatim, but that, that is a very highly held book, and I think that's just so people in of itself, how much bikinis and nuns have to offer yeah. to the Dhamma, to the understanding of the Dhamma. I mean, in, like you said, 51% of the world, if we take the amount of women that are ordained by we don't know how many talents we're missing out on. Yeah. How many of those that could become arahants and need countless people to with them to liberation, you know? We just don't know who we're stopping. Anguli Mala, of all people, became an arahant. And you yes. want to tell, they want to tell me women can't? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, you know? It's a... Uh, yeah. I think it's the future, I think it's inevitable, I think the all honesty, Thailand in terms of their, the way that their government has used Buddhism and controlled Buddhism is a bit corrupt and to certain degrees, you know, they've, the, the former patriarchs have been quite misogynistic in their, in their views and I've seen their, their dismissal of women asking them dumb questions and things like that, I think they definitely see women as sort of the temple cleaners and helpers more so than any real mm. spiritual companions or Kalyanamitas. Mm. But I'm glad that Buddhism is having a chance to grow in the West and that Western perception, as you said, this gender equality is gonna, it's gonna ripple back into the Buddhist world as a whole. Yeah. And you know, I think we're finally getting to a point in Buddhist history where the West isn't seen as this massive other <laughs> outside of like the Buddhist world. You know, I think we're really getting to a place where Buddhism has been here with Dhamma. I mean, my temple has been here a hundred years nearly. This is Dhamma. Mm over a century now in the United Kingdom mm -hmm. and I think we're becoming just as valid to have our opinions and our thoughts on what the Dhamma is and isn't Super. within our own right. Yeah. Super. Yeah. And but just, just to, a, sorry, I just want to frank a question. Yeah. When Luke, I first saw my first bhikkhuni at Hemel, then Luke explained on the way home the issues and I must say the first thought that popped into my head is, I thought this must be Buddhism. Yeah. Because it's, mm, it would seem yeah. to be the exact opposite. <laughs> it's not women, yeah. So how can we exclude people? It's Buddhism. We exclude somebody because they're female. Yeah. Or we have an hierarchical mm. system in place because mm. this mm. is not chiming for me. And it started ringing alarm bells with me, like the whole thing's a, a hoax. Mm. <laughs> it's a scam. You know, there, there can't be this schism between that and something that's supposed to be Buddhist. And I, I really struggled with that concept for... Mm. 
Yeah, that's interesting to hear that because I think it is an instinctive response that most people in the world would have if they hadn't actually been indoctrinated to some degree in the so-called <laughs> politics of institutionalised Buddhism. Yes. That is very different from Dhamma. Dhamma yeah. is Dhamma, it's universal law, it's law of nature, it's yeah. truth, it's goodness, yeah. it's for, inclusion. For, for a year before yeah. I ever... I couldn't, I'm yeah. baffling, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, mm. so you might speak for... Many people, many oh, right. people yeah. in the general <laughs> Yeah, public. I feel exactly the same. And I was just going yeah. to answer your question. It is uh, dedicated to Queen Kema uh -huh. from the suttas. Uh, uh -huh. That's one of my favorite stories mm -hmm. from the from the Terigata. Uh, mm -hmm. She was a tough nut mm -hmm. and she became a nun. And uh, Ayakema uh, that you mentioned was named after her and also I have very, very big respect for her and read many of her books and listened to her Dhamma talks and uh, I really enjoy her teaching style. Yeah. And honestly, I think, I think from the nuns I've seen, they have to try a lot harder in their practice, I think. Not in terms of like actual like meditation or that sort of the ability to have that opportunity. Yeah. And I think what I've seen is that they're much wiser as a result of having to have far more adversity in that. And that's sad to some degree, but it just shows how invaluable they are. Mm. Because there's, you know, these, as much as there's, there's, you know, the politics, the, those first women to take and even open the conversation that what, where does this go from here? You know, the founding of the Silodadas today seems like, oh, you know, the ten precepts, but, but back in its time, for them to establish that even a ten preceptor nuns, to put them in robes, to let them do arms around, these were, these were big progressions mm. at the time. Mm. And I just think, why well, are we going to stop there? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. We can't mm. stay stuck Do they eat after the monks in the Viet Cong? Yeah, 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 they do. I found that peculiar when I went to Hemel, that they went in yeah. first for the food. Right. I in mean, my... they do have, they're not, um, they don't have the same ordination platform. They are, right. like, on less precepts. It's almost like they then scurry away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like not yeah. to be seen. Right. And Luke's introduced me to some of them, they're beautiful people, and I really like talking to them. And mm. yeah. I think that's what started the process in my own mind. Wow. Mm. Yeah. They, they have got something to contribute, right. they're just mm -hmm. not allowed. Right, and maybe that's why we need our own places too. Yeah. So yeah. I think it would be nice to wind up soon, but I'm just wondering if for a few final words we could perhaps um, oh. invite your comments on maybe how you as men and Buddhists would um, consider going forward, like what is it that you could do to show, or what is it that men, you can encourage other men to do to show support for bhikkhunis and to help the bhikkhuni sangha to thrive. I think my closing statement would really be that if you really have faith in the Tathagata, in the Bhagavata, you know, in the Lord Buddha, you, you must recognize the, the fact that he recognized that women could be enlightened and that if you have that faith in that Nibbana to be attained in this life then you have to have that faith and you look at any woman you know, any woman you care for because you know, we know as Buddhists we are supposed to have compassion for beings but in that statement is a recognization that most of us don't start that way so I think I would like to say to any men or anyone else to just look at your, your mother, your sister, your female friends and ask yourself would you do you wish for them to attain the banner or not? Mm. And I think you'll find you won't be a person on earth you wouldn't wish to attain the banner. And so we shouldn't close any of the doors to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I find that, you know, explaining that to my male friends in Norway is no problem. They are like, yeah, yeah of course. Um, <laughs> but I have some good friends in Thailand and in Sri Lanka in particular that uh, they are much more reserved and uh, conservative yeah. and I find it hard to discuss those things uh, with them uh, they, they have a lot of feelings almost like superstition they believe that the Sangha will, uh, will suffer a lot from having bikinis and things that I don't really understand so it's hard for me to have a conversation to yeah. them about it and yeah. I think it's a shame because those are good friends that I really care about so yeah. it's uh, yeah it's a bit of an of an issue and I hope right. uh, to to be able to yeah I try to study the things and, and look into the to the reservations they have against bhikkhunis to be able to answer when they say some of the things that are actually wrong about uh, yeah. yeah yeah so having knowledge having education around the truth of the matter and maybe also 
uh, experiential empirical no knowledge and, and <laughs> wisdom that shows the effects, some of the positive things bikinis can bring. So, um, what are some of those things? And maybe. Yeah, it's like the, some of the typical things uh, that the Sangha will only last for 500 years. Oh, okay. You know, we um, don't find that invariance of that text. We only find it in one text, the 500 mm -hmm. years part. That's not found in any... And it's also past 500 years. Yeah, it's yeah. past 500 years. So, I mean, if they want to start saying Buddha was saying things that wasn't true, that's their business. But I say Buddha is Lokasmim, so I'm not going to say that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but what I actually meant was, um, what are some of the things that be Like, maybe one way that, you know, say in your situation where you'd like to convince your friends, maybe what's going to convince people in the end is actually um, seeing the benefit Bikinis mm. can bring. Yeah. Um, and in that sense, I'm just curious what you think. Maybe some of those benefits oh. that bhikkhunis can bring yeah, to the Buddhist think, world. Of course, uh, I witnessed it here, the way that your female supporters can, you know, get hugs and <laughs> things like that and come to a place where they feel more at home. I think that's uh, very, very valuable. It's very moving for me to be witness mm -hmm. to that uh, up close when I visit here. Um, but also for for me as a man, like I said, I'm a person who most of my friends, uh, closest friends, uh, from my whole, my whole life were, were women. So I, mm. yeah, I, I relax more and I feel more. Uh, I also have a sister and a mother who are very strong women, so mm -hmm. that's sort of what mm -hmm. I grew up with. And uh, uh, so for me, as a man, uh, it's actually also very important to have bikinis. It helps me in my practice. Okay, so what, what, what if we were born as women next life? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd be denied that part. Yeah, and you start asking them, what if you come back as a woman, would you want to be denied the rules? You know, they, mm -hmm. it's just very obvious, you know. They think, they probably just think they're going to be men forever. <laughs> and we brought two people in the last visits, as you know, that were male. Mm. Who were open-minded, Buddhist-minded people. And yeah. they've gone away super impressed. Mm. And then, it's like myself, I then spread that word in the community. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I think Zach did, it was like, yeah. wow. I expected it to be nice, but wow. Mm. And that yes. was really wonderful, because that then opens it up, doesn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Having that initial yeah. contact, feeling yeah. the benefit oh. of just Beautiful. being in good Dhamma places. Yeah. Pity they can't sort of clone you two. <laughs> 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 Then you could have it sort of like in every town and village. <laughs> the double act. <laughs> but that's what we're doing. That's twin, what we're doing by... <laughs> right, but I mean it's so impersonal and that's what we're actually doing by trying to establish a Sangha. We're trying to produce nuns, yeah. right, so that there are more of us well, to Anytime go I meet women and they even put the slightest inkling, I'm like, you should go straight away, go straight away, go get, go come around and go. Yeah, come to watch <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. It's nice to end on that note. Come to Oxford and uh, <laughs> experience a community that's diverse and inclusive, you know, and that's, uh, yeah, really interested in the good and the benefit of all beings, wherever they are, including all the invisible beings that might be here right now, and hopefully the devas who may be rejoicing with us. So, may all beings have the options that they need to, that choice to take uh, full renunciation if they wish to as bhikkhunis or any other platforms of ordination at work but give people a choice. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu.